being, thank you for um, having me be here today and, and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX um, back in June. And um, I would love anybody, um, if you have questions along the way, please put them in the chat and, and we'll get to those as we, as we go through the discussion. Um, happy, to, happy to answer any questions or provide any further information and detail that I can along the way with, with everything. So I have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to, I'm not sure here. May I share my screen? Shoot, there we go. Here we go. Let's get started here. Share. I'm gonna... There you are. There you go. Move this here so I can play that. There we go. Um, so June 23rd, 2022, this past June was the 50th anniversary of Title IX and um, the US Postal Service uh, instituted a stamp commemorating the event, um, which is shown here. So if you still have availability to go to the US Postal Service and, and get your Title IX stamps to support, I encourage you to do that. So we're celebrating 50 years of Title IX, um, which as Judy had mentioned, it's, a, it's an interesting time with, with, the, with the Roe versus, versus Wade uh, decision following 50 years of that. So um, both coincided together right around the same timeline and, and Title IX is one of the last uh, gender equity legislation pieces that still exists today. There we go. So June 23rd, 1979, 1972, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to the discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. There's a lot of key words in here that, that confuse some people. Um, one, it needs to be an education program. This was an education act. Um, covering all forms of education, not just a sports law. <laughs> um, also, it does need to be receiving federal financial assistance. So this does is a law uh, legislation that does not move beyond that educational uh, environment or you know professional environments for women in sports. Um, and it does need to receive that federal financial assistance. So there are some, areas that people get confused with, um, with understanding Title IX, with regard to um, what it does or does not cover, um, which is always good to know for our next generation and educating them on the history of Title IX. Um, so the women of Title IX, here we have three of the major women that really helped to support and, and get the legislation passed. Patsy Mink was a US Congresswoman from Hawaii. Um, and she is also known as the co-author of the Title IX le legislation and the Title IX amendment with Senator Birch Bea from Indiana. Um, and so she was really ins instigated that initial writing of the Title IX and getting that passed. Um, she was also the first woman of color and first Asian American woman in the House of Representatives. Um, and really um, known for her fight for inequities. Um, the other person that really helped to, with the legislation and creating the legislation was um, Representative Edith Street Green. She was known as Miss Education from Oregon. Um, and she really worked closely with Patsy Mink and uh, Senator Birch Bea to um, write the legislation and come up with um, the wording and she was motivated fighting inequity in education. She became really motivated when she found out that in education that boys had a program to keep them and support them to stay in school while girls did not back in 1970s. Um, so that was kind of her initial motivation to getting started um, into really fighting for those inequities in the educational environment for boys and girls. 
Um, the last one is Betsy Sandler, um, or Bernie Sandler. She was um, personally experienced sex, sex discrimination in the hiring and became known as the godmother of um, Title IX. And she began really um, documenting all the sex discrimination practices from federally funded educational programs and really um, compiling a lot of the data that she used to work with Patsy Mink, Birch Bea, and um, Edith Green to write the legislation and support that being passed for Title IX. Um, and I can't, I can't move on. Um, from women of Title IX without mentioning some of the current day supporters um, of Title IX with Billie Jean King as a professional athlete back in the 70s um, with her 1973 Battle of the Sexes um, competition and her fight for pay equity with the Tennis Association as well as the founder of the Women's Sports Foundation. She has been an advocate for Title IX um, and equity for women in sports um, throughout, you know, the past 50 years. Um, another woman that is right up there with Billie Jean King is Donna Lepiano. Um, she was a softball athlete, national championship uh, athlete, and has continued to advocate for Title IX for the past 40 years, uh, a past CEO of the Women's Sports Foundation. She was also the former women's athletic director for U University of Texas in Austin, where she um, really helped to develop the foundation and framework for women in sports and supporting women in sports in that collegiate setting. Um, so she is currently known as a national expert for gender equity in sports um, and was also along with Billie Jean King, part of the people who testified for the Title IX legislation. So those are a number of our women in history that really, uh, really started the wheels turning and, and have continued to support it uh, for the past 50 years. Um, right now, I'd like to ask everybody uh, on this call or on the Zoom to just in the, in the chat right now, put your favorite woman in sport. Who is, is part of your history as a woman in sport? Um, that you can think of that has really helped to lead the way that has helped to make change for women in sports and and i would just love to see all of the comments um to see who for who comes to your mind first when you think of you know title nine women in sports and and really helping to uh move move us forward give you a little bit of time here so There we go. Good. I can't see the chat, but use my chat. Anyone, anyone in that chat there, Felicia, that stands out coming out? Oh. All right. Moving on, I, I put this together um, and I hope to show this, especially during my classroom um, with women in sports, that, um, that this is, that Title IX isn't just legislation that started in 1972 and has just sat there. Um, throughout the years, it has continued to progress. Oh, sorry, now I don't know how to go back. Go back, back, there we go. Um, it started in 1972, yes. Um, not a lot was done with it for those, for those first 10, 12 years. Um, in 1984, it was um, really kind of looked at um, and thought like, hey, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna keep this specific to the programs that receive that federal financial aid, right? So that took out athletics, that took out a number of the programs here it shows um, the the medical internships, the robotics clubs, the athletics programs, 
that did not receive the federal funding. Um, and so it took any of that funding and said that they did not have to follow the rules of Title IX. Just a couple of years later, that ruling was reversed. Um, and any part of any institution that receives federal financial assistance, then all of the institutions must comply. So I get this question a lot with a lot of the private schools, especially here in San Diego specifically, that they don't fall under Title IX. Well, if they receive grants for special education, if they receive grants for the, the land that their school is on, then yes, they must still comply with Title IX. Um, so that's one of those uh, different rulings um, to, to kind of be aware of that if any of the part of that school or that federally funded, funded institute receives financial assistance, then, um, then the entire school and all of the programs that it supports must follow the Title IX rule. Um, again, here in 1987, still there was no true consequences to really following Title IX or reporting on um, the different numbers along with that. So um, in 1992, finally, 20 years after it was instituted, Title IX um, consequences became, you know, apparent and were awarded monetary damages for those that were victims of discrimination. Again, it was still hard to fight this and to be able to prove this. Um, and so this was one of the kickers to get enforcement for full accountability from a lot of the schools um, with compliance for following Title IX. Moving forward in 1996, the schools were complaining and trying to get their way out of uh, following Title IX with regard to sports, especially at this time. So they became um, the Office of Civil Rights, uh, kind of clarified Title IX a little bit and made three prong rule, the proportional rule, expansion prong and the accommodation rule. Proportionally, schools are supposed to, and I say supposed to because we are not even close, um, follow the representation of their student body. Um, and we'll, we'll get to this later with the current numbers, but um, almost all of the schools proportionally do not allow the number of opportunities for the percentage of female student body that, that are enrolled in the school. The second prong is expansion. If the school has a history of not providing as many female programs um, and opportunities, that they can prove that they are working to expand those opportunities for females, um, actively um, working to expand them. And the prong number three is the accommodation rule that if the school does not comply with Title IX with its numbers, with its proportional numbers, that it can verify and show that the school um, and all of the programs that it offers um, comply with the interests of the student body. So a survey must go out and women must say, no, I don't want to play uh, lacrosse, so we don't need to add a lacrosse team. Or no, I don't want to be a part of the rowing team. There's no interest. We don't have enough people to actually make a rowing team, so we don't have to provide that for our student body. Okay, so that was the proportional rule, 1996. Um, moving forward, in as again, Title IX looked at and reviewed 1997 to 1999, um, sexual harassment and guidance and rulings were added in as part of Title IX where there were a number of large decisions within the Supreme Court that connected sexual harassment, sexual violence to Title IX. 2001, um, Title IX was looked at again. Here we are, you know, less than 20 or 20 years ago, and the Office of Civil Rights reviewed Title IX and, and ultimately clarified the standards and stated that yes, Title IX is still indeed needed for gender equity. Um, and during this time, it imposed more demanding requirements on educational institutes for reporting Title IX, um, but still, Little, little effort was made to enforce any of these rules and all of these reg regulations. 
Then in 2011, with the administration, it increased the enforcement of schools for Title IX. Um, at this time, this is, this is, it increased the Title IX protections for sexual harassment um, during this decade. Um, but also with this, it, it formed the creation of the Title IX offices um, on campuses for reporting um, as well as within athletic institutions for having a Title IX compliance officer for women and girls to go to to report to find out more information on Title IX. Um, 2016 with the new, 2018 with the new administration, they pulled back a lot of what was um, instituted in the decade previously. Um, and re basically return to the framework for reporting um, Title IX instances on campuses back to the 1998-99 regulations. Um, and then again, in 2020, um, DeVos um, reevaluated those and decreased the level and the need um, for colleges to report and to investigate a lot of the sexual harassment components that were um, connected to Title IX. But here we are 50 years later, moving forward. Um, again, with the administration turnover, we're looking to reevaluate Title IX and it has been put on the docket for this administration to review um, what has happened through these 50 years. Um, and to find the best solutions for moving forward with a number of different areas um, connected to Title IX. Um, and as advocates, our biggest component is to, to really understand and connect a lot of our state laws, obviously with the Roe versus, versus Wade um, decision, we can, we can now recognize and understand it's been brought to light that, that these aren't permanent, they're not constant it has changed quite a bit through these 50 years. Um, and a lot of good has been done that we'll get to. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're not um, set in stone. So it's something that we need to continue to fight for and continue to move forward and grow with. Um, so knowing your state laws, your school policies, and really for the next generation, understanding what is involved with Title IX um, to be able to help to stand up for your team, for your sport, for yourself um, is, is gonna be really important for educating that next generation. So anybody have any questions at this time just with regard to that timeline for Title IX? I will open it up just for a second. And we, we, get, onto the, we get onto the fun stuff. Um, with sports here moving forward. So what has Title IX done for women in sports? Well, we know that um, the, the growth of women in sports has been exponential. Um, it's been a growth of over 1000% and you can see in the chart that um, we've grown to 3.4 million opportunities um, for high school sports participation for girls versus less than 300,000 uh, back in 1971, 1972. So that has been huge for women and girls in sports. Um, we, with this, you can see also with that, with that chart that we are still actually not at the level of boys participation or boys opportunities prior to 1972. So they were at 3.6 million. We're still um, at 3.4 million that we're still not at the level that, of opportunities that the boys had previous to Title IX being enacted. And yes, there are 3 million more opportunities for girls to play, participate and play in different sports across the United States um, today, but we still are at more than 1 million fewer opportunities than boys. Um, and when you look at the proportionality rule, um, that's with colleges, but um, having those 1 million fewer opportunities for girls versus boys is huge when we, when we know and recognize and understand that, that girls make up 
you know, 50, 54% of that high school population um, at that high school setting and have the 1 million fewer opportunities um, to participate. Um, so we still have work to do to overcome some of those aspects. Um, also participation, the, the boys participate in school uh, in sport at 75% versus girls participation is 60%. Um, we do know that girls drop out of sport at a greater rate than boys. Um, and these percentages are, are overall in the lower socioeconomic areas, which Title IX does not necessarily cover, these percentages are greater. Um, you know, at lower socioeconomic communities, um, girls' participation in sports is more around 40% versus the boys 60%. So those are definitely some of the areas that we need to look at moving forward for that getting girls involved in sports. So at the college level, um, again, we have grown exponentially with the number of opportunities for girls, uh, for women to play college sports. And, and Judy was telling me earlier that you know, she graduated just as Title IX was enacted and, and just the participation and the opportunities to participate following Title IX and that growth was, was amazing and, and amazing to see right after Title IX. And we've gradually gotten up to um, 60,000 more opportunities, um, still having boys having more participation than girls at the college level, which again, we look at the participation and that proportionality rule. Females are now 60% of the student body um, in the collegiate setting. So more women go to college than men, yet girls, women are still only 45% of the athletes, um, which, is, which is something that we have to continue to grow. Um, as well, males still have 60,000 more opportunities for participation than girls with regard to the participation. So we do know both at the high school and the college level that these numbers have been amazing. Um, the availability and the opportunity for girls to go and play sports at the high school and college level has, has made a huge impact, not just on sports, but um, a, across the board in, um, a number of different areas um, in life um, and employment from beyond that. One of the areas pre-Title IX and post-Title IX that actually decreased was women in coaching, um, as well as women in administration. So before Title IX, women coached over 90% of their um, female teams. Post-Title IX, that number has decreased to only 40% of women being head coaches for female teams. Um, and so that number there has really, we've lost a lot of women in coaching. Um, and that's a number that that's an area for growth that we really need to look at of giving more women opportunities to coaching, not only women's teams, but men's teams as well. Um, and the administration numbers um, right now, it's approximately 20% of women as in administration as athletic directors. That has actually grown just recently in the last five years um, from, you know, around 3% to that 20%. So it is an area that, you know, that, that Title IX with these women that have had the opportunities to play sports in college, to be involved and to coach and to move on into administration. It's the, it's the gradual linear process um, throughout their career that has been able to increase that really, really most recently just in these last uh, five years that we've seen that growth in administration, so. Where are we at? So what do we know? We do know that girls some of, some of the negatives is that girls drop out of sports at twice the rate of boys, um, which has become an issue. You know, we know that boys are participating in sports at 75%, girls are only at 60%. Um, so we, we need to really try and figure out why girls are dropping out of sports. 
Um, during the same time that they're dropping out, we also we also see that um, girls' confidence decreases by 30% greater than boys. This is during those middle school, high school years through that puberty timeline that their confidence is decreasing, they're dropping out of sports, they're decreasing their activity levels um, and you know, kind of putting their efforts into, into other areas. Um, studies have shown just the opposite, that girls, that sports, being involved in sports, being a part of a team, increases that confidence, it increases that communication, those teamwork skills, it also increases the grades of um, girls, uh, decreases pregnancy rates, it decreases dropout rates. Um, so sports have a positive impact to actually fight and interact with some of this decrease in confidence and some of these, you know, uh, emotional Socio social components that they're going through during this time when we we find that they're dropping out. Um, we also know that female executives, um, women at the executive level, greater than ninety percent played sports in high school. So this is a this is a component and a number that really needs to be um, educated to that next generation that playing sports and being involved in, in these activities is not only good for your social, emotional, and physical health, but it also rolls over into the executive and workplace um, skills that you, that you learn during that time. Um, so over 90% played in high school and over 50% played in college. So, having those skills and really having that um, aspect for girls in sports is gives them the confidence to start standing up for themselves, which as we see 50 years post Title IX, the growth of the professional opportunities for, for females saying, yes, I wanna continue to play. I wanna continue to play in the WNBA. I wanna continue to play in the NWSL. So the formation of these opportunities um, beyond that college level for women in sports has grown because of Title IX, um, that they're saying, I'm not done being an athlete yet, I wanna continue to play. Plus, along with this, um, post Title IX, the growth, not just in sports with those professional opportunities to be paid for what you love to do and what you're amazing at, um, but we've seen the growth of women in medicine and technology in politics, obviously, with you know, our vice president, as well as in entertainment with women having that confidence and stepping into the roles of being the director, of being you know, that lead, of getting paid um, as much as their male counterparts in all of these different areas. Um, females have, have stood up and with Title IX and, and started using their voice, speaking out on equal pay, again, Billie Jean King started doing it back in the 1970s with women's tennis. Obviously in the news, the US women's national team with US soccer really standing up and, and getting that equal pay and those equal benefits for the, from the men's team. Um, US hockey has had the same fight, women's hockey as, and world surfing is the only international organization that provides equal pay across the board for all of their events that they put on. Um, so the World Surfing Organization um, pays equitably for women's and men's tournaments and events um, anywhere that they have uh, competitions being put on, so. So what's going on for the future? Um, the chart on the side, you can see the allocation of funds at that collegiate level in the NCAA Division I. This is from NCAA website um, that, that men's sports, basically the total expenses are, are, you know, three times what they're paying for women's sports, more than three times what they, they pay for, or twice what they pay for women's sports, 
Um, and then with recruiting, it's three times what they're what they're paying to recruit women for um, the number of expenses that are going out. So a lot of these, um, you know, really take into effect the the women that they're getting as athletes. You know, the the coaches and how much they're paying their coaches for women's uh, teams versus men's teams. So really trying to start enforcing this compliance with the allocation of the funds, um, but as well, you know, the penalty, like I said previously, um, it, it's been addressed a number of times throughout that timeline. And the, the penalty is actually the withdrawal of federal funds. Um, even though 80 per, to 90% of institutions are not falling within that proportionality rule. 60% of student athletes or of the student body and only 45% of the athletes being female. This has never been instituted. There has never been a situation where their federal funds have been taken away because they are not complying with Title IX. Um, so moving forward, this is a big area for schools that they really need to start cracking down on. And again, through that timeline that we showed, it did show that yes, we've addressed it, we've looked at it, we've tried to make new rules and regulations and the three prong system to, to you know, work with compliance. But at the college level, you know, it's just been recently that they actually have to report Title IX um, and their numbers that, that are associated with there is no, there is nothing like that at the high school level um, at this time, which is unfortunate because that truly is where the, the formation of women in sports and girls in sports starts um, with the coaches, with the athletic directors at that high school level. That's when those girls are dropping out. So really kind of trying to enforce Title IX starting at that high school level with high schools, with middle schools, reporting their Title IX compliances, um, as well as, you know, enforcing them at the college level um, and really, really putting, you know, these, these um, withdrawal of the federal funds into effect for schools that are, that are not complying. It's been 50 years. We've waited long enough <laughs> for you to come around and figure it out. And now um, it is something that, that we really need to uh, start standing up for and using our voice for. Um, increasing opportunities. We are still missing those 1 million opportunities for girls to participate in sport. Um, and that is higher in those lower socioeconomic areas. Um, there's a number of, of instances where, where this, you know, becomes difficult with transportation for girls in those low, lower socioeconomic areas um, versus, versus some of the higher socioeconomic areas. So it does, it does put a disproportionate um, effect on, on some of the areas and some of the schools, middle schools, high schools that, that have less money, um, as well as for the families that, that have less money to participate. Um, at that high school and middle school level. Um, with, with these two, especially, the education and awareness of Title IX with this information it is really essential for the next generation. I work with girls in sports all the time and I ask them, do you know what Title IX is? No, I know how to speak up for myself at this point, but I don't know the history and I don't know what Title IX is or or why I actually have that ability and have that confidence to stand up for myself and speak my voice. Um, so really getting that education and that awareness regarding Title IX. I still have girls that I work with that say, you know what, yeah, the boys are given, you know, the, the um, big field with the lights for their games and, and we, we're, we're, we have to go and practice at the local park um, and don't, don't have the same facilities. Those, that is a basic Title IX rule, um, having those. And, and, you know, I let them know, I'm like, that is a Title IX uh, situation. So really that education and awareness of Title IX, there are, there are lawsuits still to this day, uh, recently up in Washington, um, which was highlighted on the 50 for 50 uh, ESPN video, as well as right here in San Diego at San Diego State, 
with the women's rowing team, um, stating their case, letting the school know, um, and the school not doing anything about it or pushing back. Like it really does take that lawsuit to be pushed forward for the schools to actually make a change um, in a lot of instances, um, especially for Title IX. It's been shown that, that institutions across the board um, are starting to fudge numbers for their Title IX compliance. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of one of the instances that was brought up with San Diego State in their lawsuit and, and their complaint um, that's, that's just recently um, happened with COVID. Um, so with this, we, we also know that um, more research is needed for women and girls in sports. Um, we know there are differences between boys and girls, physiology, you know, physiology, performance, injuries, um, as well as emotionally and, and mentally, yet 80 to 90% of sports studies are male dominated. And historically, almost 90% of, of the studies that have done in sport are focused on males. So, um, you know, it's as simple as the, the history intake form that was developed for a boy. Um, it was developed for the men in sports. And so re really reevaluating a lot of these different components and saying, is this equitable for a female? Um, is there more information that we should collect? Um, and really putting some of those efforts into those areas to get that information for women in sports. Um, this is, this is something I just watched the other day, being a fan of women in sports. What does being a fan mean? It means really investing in them, going to the games, um, and not just, I, I support women in sports, you know? I support, you know, the Women's Museum of California. It's a nonprofit organization, right? Women's teams are not nonprofit, okay? To be a professional team, you have to make money. Um, and so we need to be a fan. We need to change our wording of, hey, you need to come support women in sports. You need, you need to be a fan and go to the games. You really need to um, not just be there to support them um, and, and really invest and, and put that money towards them. Uh, studies have shown or, or research has shown that, you know, the MLS or the soccer, men's soccer teams um, have been supported and failed for 10 years, um, they have not turned a profit, yet they still have new owners coming in, they still have new investors investing in them. Um, as to where women's teams, if you don't turn a profit in that first year, they're willing to drop you. They'll be like, yep, we got a three-year timeline, TikTok. So that timeline for professional women's sports and women in sports is, is decreased for some reason. And we really need to make that you know, equitable for increasing um, that, that women in sports opportunities professionally. Um, and we were talking just recently, yes, tomorrow uh, I'm gonna put a plug in there for the San Diego NWSL team, The Wave. They're having their Title IX game celebrating tomorrow. Um, and um, they're the only female professional team in San Diego. Um, we'd love to see a basketball team here at some point. Um, but they're celebrating their Title IX uh, game tomorrow with, with support and um, a, good, a good competition, you know. So we really need to recognize the women in sports at the professional levels, at the collegiate levels, at the high school levels as being equitable to men, of having that same competition, of having that same drive. Um, and, and with that, putting in the same amount of work and then, you know, in turn, earning the same amount of money and getting those same benefits um, that men's teams do. Lastly, as, as we've mentioned a, a couple of times, the Roe versus, versus Wade decision, recognizing the different political components of Title IX legislation and its continued need for gender equity um, and really supporting that, that gender equity. Again, it's gonna, supposed to be reviewed and there's a number of factors um, you know, LGBT, 
LGBTQ transgender components that are all being worked into Title IX. Um, and so that's part of this, this legislation and part of moving forward with supporting gender equity across the board and all the, the federally funded institutions um, and really growing women in sport uh, across the board. Um, so those are just a lot of different areas that, that I see as to where we can increase and grow women in sports um, and not just to help support the next generation, but, but to really um, allow our girls and our next generation to fully reach their full potential in all areas and not just in sports, because as we see, we see it goes on beyond into, into their work and into their leadership and into you know, their executive positions that they, that they hold moving forward. So here are some of my resources. I just wanted to let you know, you know check out the Women's Sports Foundation. Um, it's a great resource um, as for women in sports information. And thank you. If there are any questions, please let me know. Happy to happy to answer anything as we move forward. Allison, that was an amazing presentation. You you filled our, our our hour less than an hour with so much information. And thank you for being uh, a fan of history because when we understand our history, we can understand uh, where we are today and where we are to go. Um, I, I probably had the most questions, but uh, there there's one thing that I'm curious about. Um, so this whole, the, your whole talk talked about enforcement of Title IX, that this is where the rubber meets the road, correct? That, you know, you can have the legislation, but being able to enforce it and penalize um, institutions that aren't doing the right thing is where we really see change. But from what I understand, they typically have like one little office of Title IX enforcement on, on a campus, like a half of a person, or maybe this person is doing 10 other things and they have this one little responsibility. How can we get better monitoring and tracking when we don't fund the, the enforcers? It's true, um, yes, and usually, you know, that, you know, in a lot of the smaller schools, um, that that person is is holding multiple roles. You know, yeah. they're they're the assistant athletic director as well as the the senior women's administrator. So they're they're holding the hat of a number of different um, positions, and that is limiting to be able to. So with that, it it really is you know, and at the high school level. The coach can't go and they can they can say that there's a title nine infraction that that they're not complying with title nine, but it is the girls it's the girls that okay. have to put in the complaint and mm -hmm. the parents have to support that um, and really move forward with that and recognizing and understanding that that these take years a lot of the time, unfortunately, and when you're a junior in high school, you go, well, it's, is it worth it for me to try and fight for a softball field when, when the boys just got a new baseball field? Um, and, and so I think, I think part of moving forward and, and just with the environment that we're currently in and using our voice and, and helping to support ourselves, but as well, the, that next generation of, you know, and I think the US women's national team really put it out there that it may not be for them. They're, they're only there for a certain number of years. And, and a lot of those people that started that fight aren't playing with the national right. team anymore. Um, right. But they do recognize and understand that it is for that next generation. It is for the people that come behind us um, and really, you know, kind of leading that way and starting that um, with, with regard to some of that some of those fights, you know, at that high school level, at that collegiate level, um, just recently with the, with the San Diego state case, you know, it, it started during COVID and, um, the, the people that, that banded together to begin have now mm -hmm. graduated and to actually move forward, they had to get 
current student athletes on to continue board. the fight. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and so a number of the track and field females joined into the lawsuit to to help support them because they needed that current uh, mm -hmm. student body to be a part of it. So um, wow, that, it that, is, talk about the struggle continues. I think uh, continuing education um and it should be required a required powerpoint that any um, girl that enters into uh, sports at the high school or college level needs to hear your presentation <laughs> I, would love, I would love for that to happen and i love going and talking to schools and and you know again it, it it's a fight to to get the administrations to want to educate the students on the information because then they know if they have the information, right, then they, they can have, fight. <laughs> it's a catch 22 for, for them. Right. They don't necessarily want them to have the information because they don't have the bandwidth to help support it a lot of the time. Right. I so they know that they don't have the money in their in their right. bank accounts. But they do, they do. It's over at the boys program. <laughs> so so again, you know, it's it's kind of a fight. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a catch 22 where, yes, we want to get them the information, but at the same time, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily willing to bring in a speaker to, to talk on these, you know, subjects and topics that, that help to inform and, you know, move us forward. There were a few other questions, but in, in the interest of time, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. Judy, did you have any questions that you wanted to put on the table? I will say that this program has been recorded, thank goodness. Yes. And that way, uh, anyone who had to hop off early or didn't have a chance to make it, uh, they can uh, watch it again. It was really, really good. Thank you. I learned a lot. I learned a lot of stuff that now I'm angrier than I was before. <laughs> But I'm going, to, I'm going to try to take my anger and put it into action because that's yeah. where it really matters. Yeah, you know? it's not it's not anger, it's inspiration. Inspired, it's, it's okay. Energy, mm -hmm. It's energy to, to continue to move forward. And again, I think I think a big part of it is really knowing where you have come from. You know, a, a couple of the, in the chat, you know, about, you know, recognizing and understanding those rebels and those rule breakers right. that were back in 1968, 1970s you know, that really, really kind of pushed and pushed and pushed for these to be moved forward. And we still have them today. You know, like I said, there was just a lawsuit, you know, up in Washington with a with a women's softball team. Um, and, and right here in San Diego, with San Diego State, they're breaking the rules. They're, they're not following, you know, they're not being put into the box that mm -hmm. and being told to go and do what they're, they're supposed to do. Um, so really kind of helping to understand that. Um, and I see in the chat just a couple more things that yes, depending on who's in office and what legislation is there that it changes. And, and mm -hmm. as we saw with Roe versus Wade, it, it can always change. And, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned, Title IX is one of the last gender equity laws that, that there is. And post Roe versus, versus Wade, you know, a lot of different political entities are looking at Title IX and going, you know, is this still needed today? Oh my is God. Is Title IX needed um, anymore? Mm -hmm. and, and not, and again, you know, there's a lot of different entities that have been brought into it, transgender, sexual harassment, violence on campuses, um, you know, but, but the basis is truly those equitable components for education, that equitable environment to allow opportunities for both males and females, um, both ways. And, and we get Title IX lawsuits with men, you know, volleyball, men's volleyball wants to be a right. sport. So it is right. there to support them as well. Um, so recognizing that and understanding that is, is hugely important for that next generation. Allison, thank you so much. Judy, can you sign us off here? Yes, you know, I'd just like to make one comment and, you know, so much, I'm like you, Felicia, I mean, this stirs me up because it <laughs> takes me back a, a long way to my own personal experience, but yet my joy in knowing that things have gotten better. But clearly with Allison's presentation, we have so much further to go. We do. One of the big why questions that comes out, out of this for me, uh, for uh, an arguing point and a very important point of feature, I think, is the, you know, why women's sports, why girl sports, why is this so important? What does it lead to? Just that statistic on female executives 
because it speaks to teamwork, mm -hmm. it, it speaks to individual strengths, it speaks to collaboration, it speaks to leadership. And I, in my own uh, life, uh, in my own career experiences, have seen this play out and including with myself. You know, 90% have played sports in high school and over 50% in college are influenced in female executive roles. That's powerful. That is powerful. Uh, that to me is a very powerful statistic. And mm -hmm. so it's like, how do you organize all of this information? And I think, I think the Women's Museum has a perfect opportunity to capture the essence of a lot of this and provide a home base for, you know, where can we go to learn more about this? And, and automatically, you're, you're a key point person for us here locally. How do you organize all the many voices, which really is girls and women, period, uh, in particular, how do you organize all this energy and get the inertia to really make that impact and affect change in a positive way? And well, that's on that note, I'm gonna say, yeah. I, I, I hope that we can serve in some kind of plausible way of Phyllis House uh, Cepeda, I saw your hand up, but unfortunately, we we have to honor the people who have to sign off. We're already past time, um, but you're okay, Phyllis? Okay, all right, thanks. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, please come back again. We have one more. We, we, we're not quite sure what our final uh, lecture will be for the year. We're working on it, but we'll be back with something I hope as scintillating, as interesting as what you presented today, uh, Allison. Thank you ever so much. And thank you all for taking your lunch and spending time with us today. Be well and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.